I want to introduce myself. My name is Dr. Matt Ammerman. I'm a Washington, D.C. native. I practice here at Sibley Hospital in Northwest D.C., a part of the Johns Hopkins system. I want to thank Medtronic for allowing me to participate today and talk about spinal complications and their management. Without further ado, we'll look at this one slide and then we'll begin. So I wanna talk about complication management to basically think about why they occur, how we can avoid them, and, then, and when they occur, what are the proper actions and next steps. Um, you will have had similar talks about this, but I try to break it down differently than you've probably seen in the past. When a complication occurs, we often overreact, we blame somebody else, and we don't look inward on why it may have occurred. Complications are normal. They are expected in the field of spinal surgery. They by no means imply incompetence or laziness, um, but we wanna minimize them. And if they're going to occur, we wanna mitigate the effects as much as possible to maintain a healthy patient going forward. And rather than get agitated and blame, I think we need to be pensive and look inward and really think about why they occurred in the first place. So I've broken complications down into both active and passive. And I'm using these words a little bit loose and I apologize for that, but we have acts of commission, which are more common complications. And they include things like wrong level surgery or direct anatomic injury. And then we have passive complications or acts of omission. And these can easily go unrecognized. A patient can have a complication that's never realized by the physician or even the patient. And it would also include things like making the wrong diagnosis. So I wanna jump right into what types of complications we'll, we'll discuss today. We're talking about preoperative, talking about intraoperative, and I think what we all consider complications are postoperative complications. But I think preoperative, we don't think about that much. And I wanna sort of give you a different perspective on what that means and how to manage them. So preoperative complications. I think the two things that I think about is, did I make the correct diagnosis? And did I order the right images or radiologic testing? So if somebody comes in with back pain, probably get a lumbar MRI scan. If somebody comes in with neck pain, probably doesn't make sense to get a lumbar MRI scan. But there are patients that present with a diagnosis and the improper images, and we have to weed through that to figure out, does new things need to be ordered does their clinical examination and complaints correlate with their findings? And if they don't, how can we sort of uh, fix that? So our first case is a case that I was involved in. This is a 65 year old male dentist with clumsiness in his hands and right foot drop, recently retired, looking to travel with his wife and presents with a cervical and lumbar MRI scan. The cervical MRI scan is a sagittal T2 images, so a multi-level cervical disc disease from C3-4 to through C6-7. There's no myelomalacia. The lumbar MRI scan shows multi-level lumbar disc disease with various degrees of pyramidal and central stenosis. So we can explain clumsiness from cervical stenosis. We can explain um, foot drop from lumbar stenosis or pyramidal stenosis. But something else is going on here. So when I begin to evaluate this patient, he's a second opinion. I notice that he has bilateral Hoffman signs. He has clonus in both feet sustained. He has upgoing toes, crossed adductors, four plus reflexes. He has fasciculations in the upper and lower extremities, but he has no pain. So how do we correlate this? Is this just bad cervical myelopathy, but he has upper motor neuron signs, he has lower motor, uh, motor neuron signs. This is more than just cervical myelopathy. So I sent the patient off for electrical testing um, and a combination of my clinical examination and that test demonstrated, unfortunately, the patient had ALS. I think this reflects the fact that as we do a further examination and we realize that the examination it shows more than the imaging does, we have to do additional tests to either confirm or correlate the diagnosis that we're making. Uh, it should be noted too, he had atrophy of muscles in his hands as well as in his feet. And I think uh, a laminectomy here 
would have been inappropriate. Unfortunately, the patient passed away six months after the diagnosis, uh, as expected from ALS. Our second case. This is a 35-year-old male with bilateral progressive lower extremity weakness, uh, told that he needed to have, quote, low back surgery, says he can no longer walk and has bowel and bladder as well as sexual dysfunction. He was an athlete growing up, avid uh, golfer and basketball player, can no longer do either one of those, um, and is progressively getting worse quite quickly. So this was the lumbar MRI scan that was obtained. Um, it did show some mild lumbar stenosis at L4-5 and disc disease. Um, he could not articulate what surgery was recommended, but it said involved screws and rods. So I went ahead and did a extensive clinical examination on this patient and found that he had clonus in both feet, upgoing toes, crossed adductors, significantly decreased sensation in the perianal region. And the cervical examination was totally unremarkable. He had full strength, no Hoffman sign, no neck pain, no arm pain. So really localizing to the thoracic or lumbar spine and given the overt myelopathy and nothing seeing on the MRI scan, I wanted to get additional testing. So I ended up ordering a thoracic MRI scan to rule out multiple sclerosis, a thoracic cord compression. And what did I find was a thoracic AVM. So on the sagittal T2 images, you can see edema within the spinal cord. You can see the multiple enlarged in veins. And this patient had a type four dural AVM, went to surgery, surgery was successful. The post-op imaging looked great and he basically is postoperatively normal back to all activities. And I think this calls into um, account that clinical examination is still very important. And when we can't explain symptoms based upon an exam, additional testing must be done. All right, let's jump into intraoperative complications. So these are, I think, what we think about more than anything else is complications that we cause in a surgery. It can be an anatomic injury, like damaging a nerve root, spinal fluid leak. Uh, there can be a blood vessel abnormality we're not aware of. Uh, instrumentation can be placed inappropriately. It can be too medial or too, uh, too inferiorly. Uh, a cage can be placed uh, where you don't want it. You can lose a cage in the belly. Wrong level surgery, patients who have thoracic spine surgery, sometimes we can miss exactly uh, the proper level. So we gotta think about that. And then positioning the patient. Do we do neuromonitoring to make sure there's no peripheral nerve injury? Does a woman have large breasts that need to be positioned appropriately? Do they have a shoulder injury that requires positioning? Is there a pre-existing neck problem that requires positioning? So we wanna think about different ways to avoid intraoperative complications. So the first case, this is a 75 year old male with cervical myelopathy and progressive symptoms. He had prior surgery, went well at uh, ACDF at C5-6 and C6-7. Um, I was consulted, unfortunately, in this case after the fact. This patient presents for surgery and comes in with the uh, following imaging. This is a cervical MRI scan with a axial cut just above the uh, C3-4 disc space. We can see that there is myelomalacia in the cervical spine. There is multi-level cervical stenosis, uh, and there is a prior surgery below. What was failed to be recognized in this specific case was a really small right vertebral artery and an anatomic variant where the left vertebral artery is actually within the vertebral body and medial. Uh, making things even worse is that because of a prior right-sided approach, the physician of record took a left-sided approach, more likely bringing that artery into uh, play. The discectomy at both levels was uncomplicated. Cages were placed without difficulty. But uh, upon placing the plate, uh, the lateral screw at C3-4 was too lateral and immediate uh, arterial bleeding was found. The screws were placed. It was tamponaded through uh, patties and gel foam. Um, and appropriately, the patient went down for an angiogram once he was deemed hemodynamically stable. This is a cerebral angiogram. Uh, we can see the plate with the digital subtraction images sort of very faintly, but the lateral screw here has 
either occluded or partially occluded the left vertebral artery. To make things more complicated, uh, some of the material used to get hemostasis then embolized through the blood vessel going to the brain, causing a posterior circulation stroke. Um, this is a MRA done postoperatively. You can see that there's been a cutoff or less contrast in the left vertebral artery. Uh, what happened here? It was a failure of a surgeon to recognize an anatomic variant and then act accordingly. If you had to go anteriorly, this would be a case maybe to only do a standalone cage and not put a plate on, or just put inner body spacers and a hard collar. Um, I would have recognized this and uh, come posteriorly with lateral mass screws and a laminectomy. But I think as a surgeon, we have to expect and recognize anatomic variants, specifically in the cervical spine and most specifically vertebral arteries because they can run through the disc space, they can run through the bone, they can be larger or smaller. Uh, you obviously want to avoid a dominant uh, vertebral artery on either side. And I think had this been recognized, the choice of approach would have changed and the patient would have had a different outcome. The patient clearly needed to have surgery. The question would, uh, would have been better to go posteriorly and do a laminectomy and hope that there's improvement through indirect decompression. The next case is a 40-year-old female with a history of axial back pain and lumbar disc disease. She has failed extensive non-operative treatment for her back pain, physical therapy, cortisone shots, chiropractic treatment, anti-inflammatories, oral steroids, and appropriately wants to have spinal surgery. Uh, uh, imaging and uh, injections correlate to the uh, L5-S1 level. L5-S1 radiculopathy is diagnosed. Uh, she is obese. Um, Preoperative x-rays were obtained. Uh, Lumbar x-rays, AP image here, uh, do not show any overt pathology, but on the lateral image, uh, it is noticed that she does have transitional anatomy and there's an incompletely fused L5 S1 level or S1 S2 level. Lumbar MRI scan obtained subsequently does show a disc herniation at L5 S1 and a partial or almost a pseudo disc here at S1 S2. This was recognized by the surgeon preoperatively, but intraoperatively given the use of fluoro and um, sort of not paying attention, uh, the wrong level was operated on. This is the L4-5 level. So we are operating at this level, not the level of intended surgery. The patient goes to recovery. The surgery itself is, was uncomplicated. This is immediately recognized in PACU by the surgeon of record. Uh, a full disclosure is made to the patient saying, we operate at the wrong level because of your transitional anatomy. We cannot leave the level alone at L5S1. We recommend that you go back to the operating room to repeat the surgery. So appropriately, the patient and physician agreed. Uh, she goes back to the OR uh, and has now a two-level fusion, so L4 to S1. Uh, I commend the physician for full transparency. There was no secrets. The patient actually was incredibly appreciative about the honesty. And in this case, no legal action was taken against the physician for this complication. While I think that is rare, uh, I think being open and honest with your uh, patients when complications occur uh, can only help the situation. Uh, being secretive or not explaining things entirely will only get you in trouble. The moral to the story is think about transitional anatomy. If you're not sure, have radiology, review your images intraoperatively before hardware is placed and disc is removed. The last case for intraoperative complications is a 70 year old female with chin on chest deformity, severe neck pain, poor quality of life, inability to ambulate. I mean, really going downhill. And I think we would, would all agree this patient needs to have surgery. This is a representative image of what the deformity looked like. And again, these are representative x-rays of how bad the deformity was. Everyone agreed the patient needed surgery. A plan was for uh, pedicle subtractin osteotomies of the cervical spine with correction of her uh, curvature. The case itself, prolonged uh, uh, patient prolonged face down, 
six hour case, uh, about two liters of blood loss, uh, long operation. Uh, when the patient goes to recovery, uh, has been transfused, is uh, had an A-line, uh, is now normotensive. There was no significant hypotension intraoperatively, uh, but the patient, as they woke up, said, I cannot see. The neurosurgeon saw the patient immediately, confirmed the patient was only having light perception in both eyes. And the question is, what happened? When a patient's positioned prone, uh, significant blood loss, multiple liters, uh, in this type of operation, uh, this is a known complication. The problem in this case was, is the physician of record did not explain to the patient that this complication could occur. Uh, it was glossed over. And I think had the discussion been had preoperatively, the patient would have been more understanding, regardless of obviously they'd be upset. And I think ultimately the patient did improve to not finger counting, not much more than that. But there isn't much you can do for these patients when this occurs. This is a terrible complication. Uh, we all agreed the patient was going to have surgery. There was no way they could not do it. But I think a better discussion, better documentation by our surgeon would, I think, have prevented uh, legal action, which occurred postoperatively. The last discussion we're going to talk about is sort of expected and unexpected postoperative complications. And expected postoperative complications uh, can be things like I took a tumor out, your foot's gonna be weak postoperatively. That's just normal. Uh, unexpected would be like my quadricep is weak, but I was operating at the L5S1 level. Why is that occurring? Uh, an infection, both superficial and deep postoperatively, as well as a patient having surgery doing quite well for six months to a year, and suddenly they're no longer doing quite well. So we're gonna jump into these discussions and figure out cases, how to avoid these and how to manage them. So our first case is a 49-year-old female with lumbar degenerative disc disease who has failed five months of non-operative treatment. She undergoes a L5-S1 decompression infusion. Surgery is uncomplicated. Um, Post-operatively, within a week of surgery, she's having high temperature, chills, and a stiff neck. What do we do? Patient calls my office. I chat with her on the phone. I am clearly concerned about an infection. I'm concerned that she has some nuchal rigidity, potentially has meningitis. I would be shocked if that's the case because there was not a CSF leak, but we wanna think about that. I have her come to the emergency room. I get an MRI scan and I see a large posterior fluid collection. Um, I'm kind of surprised that there's a collection there. Nonetheless, um, we get axial images as well. We can see a fluid collection. I don't see anything enhancing down deep I don't see anything affecting the canal. Um, I think the neck stiffness is a, not a true neck stiffness as in meningitis, but what do we do? Well, I saw a large fluid collection here. She's early post-op. I took her back to the operating room that evening. I washed her out. I irrigated with vancomycin and, uh, uh, excuse me, genomycin or tobramycin solution. I then uh, placed vancomycin powder in the wound, which I don't do normally in routine cases. I left uh, two drains, one deep, one superficial, and I closed the wound over those drains. Uh, the drains put out for about a week and then they stopped putting out. She was given a pick line and treated with IV vancomycin. Uh, she ended up going out MRSA postoperatively. Uh, imaging done remotely showed no further collection of fluid, and it never appeared that she ever had a hardware infection or a deep infection. It appeared to be all superficial, but regardless, we were aggressive given her BMI and the horror that was placed. It had a happy ending, but I think the key here was being aggressive and getting it drained, and more importantly, making a diagnosis and not letting it sit there in the office for two or three weeks. Our next case. This is a 40-year-old female with right leg pain and low back pain for many years, um, elects to have a L5-S1 decompression infusion, but now in recovery has new left-sided leg pain, specifically has weakness in their left foot. So this was a case that was referred to me. The patient comes to see me about one year after their surgery. Um, this patient's had ongoing left leg pain. It has not improved. Interestingly enough, uh, axial imaging was never obtained postoperatively, but was told the x-rays look fine. 
So this was the x-ray she had done the day after surgery. Um, I was concerned that the left L5 uh, pedicle screw was medial. Uh, this was told that it was not by the surgeon of record. Um, second imaging was done. Again, said that the imaging was fine. The lateral film showed the cage is in good position, but an MRI scan obtained shortly after seeing me definitely showed some metallic artifact or potentially the screw was medial. And I felt that given the hardware there, uh, additional imaging like a CT monogram would be the most useful for us. So that's what I did. I got a CT monogram and it ended up that the left L5 screw was going through or partially through the left L5 nerve root. So this was a complicated situation. I felt that the patient had uh, ongoing symptoms of L5 radiculopathy. Electrical testing showed a partial but not complete denervation of the L5 innervated muscles. And I recommended to the patient that she have the hardware removed bilaterally. I took all the hardware out because she had a solid fusion across her disc space. Might as well get rid of the hardware for uh, further imaging if necessary down the road to look at her nerve root. The screws came out encountered spinal fluid as I would have expected. I was prepared for that. I was able to repair it uh, and fix the leak. Uh, and the patient had electrical improvement over the next couple of months, but never had any clinical improvement. But I would say that her pain was slightly decreased compared to where she was uh, uh, preoperatively. Uh, unfortunately, she did not improve as much. I think the big moral here is a patient wakes up with a new deficit in, in the recovery or a couple of days post-op, get axial imaging, it's okay to malposition screws, that's not malpractice, and move them. You're gonna have improvement clinically when you uh, move a screw a week, a month afterwards and waiting a year to move it. This is gonna be our last case for complication management. Uh, this is a 69 year old female with an L4-5 spondylolisthesis with back and leg pain. She's had 10 years of symptoms. She's known about her spondylolisthesis and she's failing non-operative treatment, which has been physical therapy and cortisone shots, as well as over-the-counter medications. After much convincing, she agrees to go for a lumbar fusion. This is her preoperative imaging. So a grade uh, one, almost two spondylolisthesis, vacuum disc at L4-5, uh, bilateral foraminal stenosis and a disc bulge here, more of a pseudo bulge has a uncomplicated surgery, it goes well, she is discharged, she has a solid fusion at six months, but returns about a little over a year after surgery with severe back and leg pain. And when I pushed her on it, she was having more symptoms around nine to 10 months post-operative, but didn't want to bother me about it. So I obtained uh, x-rays, excuse me, of her lumbar spine, screws and rods are in good position, uh, the cage is in good position. She has a fusion across her disc space, but what she developed, uh, frankly, unexpectedly, was adjacent segment disease with a now a spondylolisthesis above L4-5. So she was not eager to go back to the operating room. Uh, MRI scan did show bilateral foraminal stenosis from a pseudo disc bulge, but I did convince her to consider at least uh, having some injections. And right now she's doing quite well. Uh, overall, uh, she's not eager to have more surgery. She's uh, functioning as best as she can. I think the COVID pandemic slowed her down from getting additional treatment. What happened? I think what happened here was my failure to appreciate multi-level instability uh, in an obese patient and stay on top of her. I probably should have imaged this patient more frequently and definitely should have kept closer tabs on her. Um, patient was never unhappy with me but I think this probably was a patient who had multi-level instability and should have had a two-level fusion preoperatively, but it just wasn't appreciated by me uh, preoperatively. So those are my sort of take on preoperative complications, intraoperative complications, and postoperative complications. I wanna thank everybody for listening to me drone on and uh, go over these discussions. I'm happy for any questions or concerns. I'm always reachable and happy to discuss these cases at further length if anybody wants to. Wishing you all a healthy and happy 2021 and hoping that things only get better for all of us going forward. Thank you for your time and attention.
And these are some uh, slides that I want to just include for disclosures for the use of the hardware, CD Horizon, Capstone, and Arctic L3D TI uh, spinal uh, system. Thank you.